Hello, welcome to week five of science fiction with Professor Ellis. I uh, hope everyone's doing well, uh, that uh, you're hanging in there with all your classes um, and other things that you have going on in your life, work, etc. Um, I also hope that everybody's staying well. You know, make sure that uh, you're still masking up, uh, trying to maintain distance between others, uh, and certainly as soon as um, you or your family members uh, are able to get in line for vaccine, please make sure that you get vaccinated, uh, not just to protect yourself, but uh, to try to protect others as well. Um, so we have a lot of things to cover during this week's class. Now that we are getting further into the history of science fiction. Uh, but before we get into uh, today's lecture, uh, there's a couple of things I want to just kind of go over, kind of lay out what we're going to be doing during this week's class. Uh, first off, I uh, want to give you a reminder about note-taking. You know, at the very beginning of the semester, I talked about the Cornell method as being a preferred way for you to make notes. But any method that you are comfortable using so that you're making good and useful notes for yourself is perfectly fine. Uh, and you'll want to be making notes on the lectures as well as on the readings. And you can use your notebooks for your research on your research essay that I introduced in last week's lecture. Now, not only do I think uh, making good notes are important for you to learn the material in the class, but as you should remember, this is also a big part of your grade. Uh, and so during uh, the homework discussion at the end of today's class, I'll show you how to submit your midterm notebooks, which are due um, by next week. Um, so everything that you've assembled into your notebook so far, you will scan into a PDF, and then I'm going to give you a link for you to upload that PDF to uh, on Dropbox. Um, you don't have to have a Dropbox account for you to submit that work. Uh, I'll show you how that uh, operates at the end of today's lecture. So looking ahead on the syllabus, um, I'm going to go over to our Open Lab site and I've clicked on Syllabus over on the left navigation menu. And uh, while we're here, just under grading, you can see your midterm grade is worth 20% of your grade. And it's with that I'll be able to um, give out uh, midterm grades, which again, they don't actually go on your transcript. It's just a way of letting you know whether you're doing well in the class or if maybe you should be worried and should work harder. Uh, as long as I see best effort on uh, your notebooks, you're going to be getting all the credit on that. Uh, and then that'll definitely give you a satisfactory grade in the class. Um, that along with your weekly writing assignments that you guys have been turning in and seeing a really good work that you're, you're doing with that and I appreciate that because not just do I think that's useful to you to help develop like your writing skill, your summarization skills, um, but it also is a feedback mechanism so I can see like what you're paying attention to in the class, what do you think is important and also what connections you might be making between what we talk about in class with things that you already know about. Because you, all of you in, in the class are bright people that have you know, very interesting backgrounds, are interested in a lot of different things. And so I want you to draw on that vast amount of experience that you have uh, because it's, it's very valuable, uh, not just for you know, your enrichment in the class, but it can be beneficial for others too. Um, so that's with the grades that we have going on right now. Now, if we go down to the tentative schedule, and we're going to go down to week five. So in this week, uh, this week's lecture, we're going to be talking about proto-science fiction. You read for today's class, H.G. Wells' The Time Machine Abridged, meaning it's been shortened, uh, and E.M. Forster's The Machine Stops. And we're going to be talking about those stories and some other things about the historical development of science fiction through the 19th century following Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, published in 1818. Now, just looking ahead for next week, uh, you have readings by Hugo Gernsback. Uh, this is an editorial called A New Kind of Magazine. It's only one page, but that lays out um, the foundation for what would become known as science fiction. So it's very important to read, and we'll talk about that next week. 
Then we have E.E. E. Doc Smith's and Lee Hawking's Garby's uh, The Skylark of Space, Part 1. This is a serial, meaning that the story was broken up and published in separate issues of uh, the magazine over a series of months. Um, this will be the introduction, like the very beginning of the story. But what's important about uh, The Skylark of Space is that uh, E.E. E. Doc Smith really laid the groundwork for what will become known as space opera. Uh, and so this story doesn't go into as much depth about that, but at least it'll give you a taste for some of the writing um, and some of the uh, in inventiveness that goes into the stories that would become space opera about these adventures with science and technology. And then finally, uh, C.L. Moore's Chamblot. And we'll talk about that also a part of uh, space opera, but also it, I think you'll see many connections between it and later science fiction, such as the first Star Wars film. Uh, so we'll talk about that more next week. And then, as I mentioned, do by next week your midterm notebook, which you'll submit on Dropbox. I'm going to give you a link for that. And then your 250 word reply to the weekly writing assignment, where you summarize what are some of the highlights from lecture and the readings. What are some connections you're making uh, between the readings between the readings and things that you already know about. Uh, everything's fair game uh, with those weekly writing assignments as long as it's focused on the topics of the class in some way. And I'm just grading those on best effort because that regular writing practice will make you a better writer, um, but it also gives you time uh, cognitively to work over uh, the topics in the class. All right, so that's syllabus stuff. So. Let's get into the lecture, and then at the end of class, we'll talk about uh, the research essay again, uh, which I introduced last week, and we'll talk about homework. All right, so in today's class, we're going to be talking about proto-SF, proto-science fiction, uh, like the, the things that came before, like what we um, called science fiction when there was an actual word for it. Uh, so, you know, previously we talked about like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is the first example of science fiction. And while it is, there wasn't yet a word at that time or a term at that time to describe um, that kind of literature, at least not in terms of the way we think about it today. And in the years after Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, there were other stories that we can also point to and say that these are science fiction or these are science fictional um, stories. And that's where we're going to be talking today about proto-SF. But just to help make sure that everybody is like you know, keeping up and knows what's going on with the material that we've already covered, um, let's briefly recap from last class. So we read Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley's 1818 novel Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus. Uh, it's about Victor Frankenstein, who turned away from pseudoscience, meaning like not real science, and alchemy, and pursued the sciences of chemistry and galvanism and anatomy to discover how to give life to inanimate matter. He constructs a creature that looks like a large man, but he abandons it in horror and disgust. The creature, a being with a mind like a blank slate, a tabula rasa, uses reason, observation, and trial and error to learn how to survive, learn to speak, read, and write. Believing he had mastered language enough to convince a family of refugees to accept him, the creature confronts them, but they recoil in horror. Angry at humanity for how he had been treated, the creature chooses vengeance against his creator. He kills Victor's younger brother, William, and he frames the innocent Justine for the crime. Then the creature bargains with his creator, build a mate for him and he will leave humanity. Victor agrees to his creature's demand, travels to the far reaches of Scotland to create a female version of his creature, but then realizing she will have free will and reason just like his creature, he destroys his work before giving her life so as to avoid her unknown choices and possibly the creation of a new race of beings. Enraged, his creature tells Victor, I will be with you on your wedding night, and flees. 
The creature kills Victor's best friend Clerval, and Victor is suspected of the crime. Released, Victor makes his way back to Switzerland to marry Elizabeth. After the wedding, the creature kills Elizabeth, and Victor pursues him all the way to the Arctic where Victor meets Captain Walton, uh, which we first encountered at the beginning of the story. Remember those narrative frames I talked about in a previous lecture. After Victor's death, the creature appears to Captain Walton, laments his creator's passing, and disappears, vowing to end his own life. So while we can point to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein as being the first work of science fiction, there took a number of historical and cultural developments for the literary genre of science fiction to take the form that we know it as. Historically, a different philosophical and scientific worldview had to emerge. This took place uh, in the 17th century, uh, but it took time well into the 18th and 19th centuries before it was more widely established. These were the ideas of the Age of Enlightenment and the scientific revolution that we discussed previously. Unfortunately, some of these ideas continue to be challenged to this day. Also, the, the social revolutions of the late 18th century demonstrated that social structures were fragile and possible of change. Consider the American and French revolutions. These revolutions were made possible by the changing worldview of the Age of Enlightenment and what followed, including the political thinking of people like Mary Shelley's parents, William Godwin and Mary Wollstonecraft. Now, the literary genre, or the literary category of science fiction, takes shape thanks to the combination of other, other literary genres. First, there are the fantastic voyages, such as the Epic of Gilgamesh from 2100 BC, Homer's Odyssey from 800 BC, or even older, uh, Cyrano de Bergerac's Other Worlds from 1657 to 1662, and Jonathan Swift's Gulliver Tra Gulliver's um, apostrophe S Travels, 1726. Second. There are utopias. Remember from the first lecture, utopia, spelled O-U-T-O-P-I-A, meaning no place, or utopia, E-U-T-O-P-I-A, meaning a good place, which began with Sir Thomas More's Utopia, uh, originally published in Latin 1516 and translated into English in 1551. Now third, uh, we have the French writer Voltaire, who developed the Conte Philosophique, or Philosophical Tale. Uh, this is a painting of Voltaire here. Uh, and his, his story type, Conte Philosophique, is spelled C-O-N-T-E-P-H-I-L-O-S-O-P-H-I-Q-U-E. Conte philosophique in French, and then in English, it's philosophical tale. And just to pause for just a moment here, I know I'm throwing a lot of information at you, um, in the, in particularly in this lecture, and the, the goal is to capture what you can, uh, to try to, um, some things that we talked about before, such as the epic of Gilgamesh, you already have that in your notes. Uh, but new stuff like Voltaire, that would be something that you would want to prioritize for putting into your notes. Um, and I, look, I'm also just asking for best effort. Uh, I'm not expecting you to capture every single thing that I talk about, but those things that later on in the lecture, particularly about today's uh, readings or um, other points that I think are very important, I'll try to highlight and say this is something that's really important you need to put in your notes. Uh, but right now we're going through a lot of background. Um, and so not everything has to be captured, but things that, that jump out at you, put them in your notes. Why not? You might learn something. Remember it for one day when you're on Jeopardy, and then you can go make a lot of money on the show and then come back and treat me to like a steak dinner or something. So we're talking about Voltaire. Here's a picture of him, a portrait of him from 1724. Um, and the Conte Philosophique uh, stories um, have a purpose to serve as satire 
Um, and satire, if you're, you probably are familiar with the, the word, but a good definition for it is the use of humor, irony, exaggeration, or ridicule to expose and criticize people's stupidity or vices, particularly in the context of contemporary politics and other topical issues. It does this as a kind of Gedanken experiment or thought experiment. Now this is a term I do want you to put in your notes. Uh, Gedanken experiments, a German word, G-E-D-A-N-K-E-N-E-X-P-E-R-I-M-E-N-T. It's all one word. Germans like putting like their, they build their words out of smaller words. So Gedanken experiment means thought experiment in English. Fourth, uh, another you know, element that had to take place before science fiction came into its own is that science fiction borrows from the gothic genre's uh, critical bite. Now here's an example of the gothic from a, a painting by Caspar David Friedrich, the Abbey in the Oakwood. Um, so what is the gothic? So the gothic is largely a reaction to the Enlightenment's value of reason. It is often romantic or idealizing. And so these ideas about the Gothic might be beneficial to some of you depending on like what you might choose for your um, uh, research topic for the essay in this class. So this may be something you do want to also put in your notes. Uh, so it's an, a reaction to the Enlightenment's value of reason. It is often romantic or idealizing. And when I say romantic, it, just like I mentioned in our earlier lectures, uh, romantic doesn't mean like um, romance novels, right? Romantic um, means about like idealizing the world, idealizing nature and our place in the world. Um, the Gothic features a strong element of the mysterious or supernatural, uh, essentially the unknowable, as opposed to the Enlightenment's focus on knowing or understanding the world. Another characteristic of the Gothic, uh, typically, is the persecution of a woman in an isolated location. And then finally, um, this period um, of like you know, the the pr before science fiction comes into its own uh, heralded greater technological and social anticipations greater technological and social anticipations. Put another way, there were greater changes to everyday life by technology, and people were beginning to anticipate this change. They were looking forward to it or expecting it. There were technical advances in work and daily life. There were more opportunities and access to education. With greater education access, there were more literate people who read newspapers, magazines, and a new kind of print literature called the dime novel. These dime novels typically cost uh, five to six cents. They were produced very cheaply. Uh, the writing was bad, but it excited readers with the invention story, lost race stories, and Marvel stories. Marvel meaning like marvels of the world, uh, like in, you know, amazing technology, scientific discoveries, uh, natural wonders. The, these are marvels, not not in the sense today we think of like yo the Marvel Cinematic Universe by Marvel Comics is totally different meaning, uh, it, except in the sense like you know superheroes are kind of a marvel. Uh, an early example of these dime novels is Edward S. Ellis's, uh, no relation, uh, The Steam Man of the Prairies from 1868. And here's the cover of uh, the first installment of this uh, in the publication American Novels. This story is also called an Edison Aid, E-D-I-S-O-N-A-D-E. An Edison Aid is a story that mirrors the myth of Thomas Alva Edison, the so-called Wizard of Menlo Park, 
uh, who as a young inventor finds great success and in terms of the stories it, these Edison aids are about young inventors who find success and adventure with the, inven the inventions that uh, they create and Thomas Alva Edison uh, as you're probably familiar with um, you created a, a great number of inventions during his lifetime during the 19th century um, which you know were transformative uh, in terms of the world that would um, flourish you know, with these inventions in the 20th century. So again, keep like you in your mind, like right now, Frankenstein's published in 1818. That's the beginning of the 19th century. And then over the years through the 19th century, as it unfolds, there is all these historical developments, uh, scientific developments and technological developments. So keep in mind like that's the period that we're focusing on at, and also a little bit into the very early part of the 20th century. Uh, so we might call this like the long 19th century, meaning like it blends over a little bit into the 20th century. So it's also important to consider some of the historical and scientific advancements in the years after the publication of Frankenstein in 1818 uh, over the, what I phrase, the long 19th century. Some of the abolitionist goals set forth in the Enlightenment came to fruition with Britain's Slavery Abolition Act in 1833 and the American Civil War from 1861 to 1865 along with President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation on September 22nd, 19, I mean, sorry, 1862. Um, I mean, the idea here, like from the Enlightenment, was that like all men are created equal. Uh, and so one of the, the things that, that came out of the Enlightenment was that, you know, slavery obviously is wrong. If we are all created equal, one person can't own another person. And so this was like one of the, 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 um, big like you know, um, successes in a sense of the Enlightenment uh, to to do away with slavery um, and to to do away with the transatlantic slave trade uh, so that you know at least there was even though obviously there was there were still issues of uh, obviously with racism and oppression of different peoples uh, but like this was the first step toward trying to achieve the Enlightenment's ideal of uh, equality of human beings. Also, Charles Darwin published The Origin of Species in 1859, making the case for evolution by natural selection. Um, I mean, again, The Origin of Species itself is, is, is kind of tied up in um, the, some of the ideas behind the Enlightenment and um, the abolitionist movements is that you know if we are all uh, animals, if we are all evolved uh, over a period of time in relation to our environment uh, and the stresses placed on us by our environment, then does that not also um, you know, establish biologically how we are all equal? Other things, uh, while inoculation with weakened or similar disease-causing agents such as cowpox uh, was known to reduce uh, smallpox mortality, uh, Louis Pasteur in France developed the first vaccine for rabies and created the process of pasteurization that keeps our foods like milk safe. Uh, James Clerk Maxwell discovered the equations governing classical electromagnetism in 1861. Dmitry Mendeleev uh, gave us the periodic table in 1869. And Henry Becquerel discovered radioactivity in 1896. In astronomy, international cooperation began between observatories in the 19th century to create a photographic map of the night sky. Neptune was discovered in 1846, and in 1859, uh, Bunsen, as you probably are, you recognize from Bunsen burners, Bunsen and Kirchhoff used the earlier invention of the spectroscope by Joseph von Fraunhofer in 1814 to establish that spectral lines of observed sunlight 
correspond to those produced by chemicals burned on Earth. Uh, then in 1874, the transit of Venus permitted an accurate calculation of the distance from the Earth to the Sun. And Giovanni Schiaparelli first described the canals of Mars in 1877, uh, which had a huge impact on uh, people's thinking about other worlds and the possibility of life on other worlds, even though these canals, these channels, uh, you know, weren't, uh, you know, artificially made at that time you they didn't know and there was a lot of speculation about what they might be uh, then thinking about technology in the 19th century while the first steam locomotive began service in 1804 the first public rail line didn't open until 1825 in England then the internal combustion engine comes along in 1826 the electric motor in 1829 the telegraph in 1837, the daguerreotype photographic process in 1839, Alexander Graham Bell's patent for the telephone in 1876, the phonograph in 1877, the light bulb in 1879, and x-rays in 1895. So there's all this you know, uh, terrific uh, innovation going on in science and technology. There's these historical movements taking place that are trying to create more equality uh, for all people. And so this is radically changing the world in a very short amount of time. And that change taking place, um, you know, changed the way people saw the world, the way they saw themselves, the way they saw others, and the way they interacted with others and thought about their place in the world. So all of these things were going on, and obviously that's going to have an, an effect on uh, the types of stories that we you know, tell. And this is what you know, further led to more innovations in what we now call science fiction. Now, within the changing and interconnected social, scientific, and technological realms, there are several notable proto-SF writers who I would like you to know about. So these are names uh, and um, dates for birth and death and details about their writing that I want you to put in your notes. This is, this is some of the important stuff. So the first you can see here is Edgar Allan Poe. Make sure you spell his name correctly. It's E-D-G-A-R, Edgar Allan, a-L-L-A-N Poe, P-O-E. And he was born in 1809 and died tragically young in 1849. 1809 to 1849. So Edgar Allan Poe is the originator of the horror story and the great detective story. And he's also an innovator in psychological realism and poetic form. He influenced the French symbolist movement, S-Y-M-B-O-L-I-S-T, French symbolist movement. And he melded science with mysticism. So he like combined some of these things, you know, in part maybe to for one to explain the other, or for you know mysticism to um, maybe account for those things that you know, were as yet unexplained in science. Among his stories, I'll mention two. First, the narrative of Arthur, A-R-T-H-U-R, Gordon Pym, P-Y-M, of Nantucket from 1838, uh, which is a fantastic adventure story involving shipwrecks and sailing to unknown lands. And the second story is the facts in the case of Monsieur Valdemar, V-A-L-D-E-M-A-R, from 1845. Um, and this story explores what would happen if a person on the edge of death were mesmerized, or what we would call hypnotized. The idea being that if you hypnotize someone, would this put them in a state of suspended animation? Um, 
and also there's that word mesmerized. So in this story, Poe uses the rhetoric of science, like using science as a way to provide some sort of support for his ideas. Um, and he used the rhetoric of science and the ideas of Franz Anton Mesmer, M-E-S-M-E-R, uh, who was born in 1734 and died in 1815, who was an Austrian physician who created a therapeutic technique involving hypnosis. So you might hear like in old movies, for example, um, someone may say you've been mesmerized. Well, the idea is that mesmerizing is what we think of as hypnosis. It's just attached to his name. The second author uh, from this uh, proto-SF period that I want you to know about, uh, I'm sure you've probably encountered in uh, maybe high school or middle school, is Nathaniel Hawthorne, N-A-T-H-A-N-I-E-L, Hawthorne, H-A-W-T-H-O-R-N-E. And Nathaniel Hawthorne was born in 1804 and he died in 1864. Nathaniel Hawthorne, who you might know as the author of the 1850 novel The Scarlet Letter about the adulteress Hester Prynne, um, also wrote some very important proto-SF. Uh, there are many scientists and inventors uh, in his other fiction stories. These include mesmerists and biologists. He depicts the creative and destructive skills of the sciences. His stories feature fantastic events that are given naturalistic explanations. You can think of his fiction as a response to the emergence of a technical scientific elite during the 19th century. And I'll mention two stories by Nathaniel Hawthorne. The first is The Birthmark from 1843. It's a short story, so it goes into quote, quotation marks, quote, the birthmark, end quote. Um, when I mention novels, I'll, I'll try to always point that out, but novels, like in your notes, you should underline the title, and when you're typing these titles of like a novel or a film, those would be italicized uh, using your word processing software. The idea being is that big works like novels, uh, collections, films, albums, those things are italicized or underlined to indicate that it's a big work. Smaller things uh, like a short story or an individual song from an album, these go into quotation marks, uh, meaning that there is something sm a smaller work or a smaller part of a larger work. So the birthmark from 1843 is about a beautiful woman with one blemish, a birthmark in the shape of a hand on her cheek. Her husband obsesses over it and creates a potion to remove it. While he's successful in removing the birthmark, the potion kills the woman. Then in the second story by Nathaniel Hawthorne, I want to mention, uh, it's titled uh, Rappuccini's Daughter. This is a short story, uh, so that goes into quotes, and Rappuccini is spelled R-A-P-P-A-C-C-I-N-I, -C -C Rappuccini's Daughter, from 1844. And this is a story about a poisonous maiden uh, who gains resistance to poisonous plants, but in doing so becomes poisonous herself. She dies when the man she loves gives her an antidote. And then the third writer uh, I want you guys to know about from the proto-SF era uh, that we didn't read for today's class is the French writer, you, you can see here, Jules Verne. Uh, his name is spelled J-U-L-E-S Verne, V-E-R-N-E. -E. And he was born in 1828 and died in 1905. 
So Verne was influenced by Edgar Allan Poe, so much so that he wrote a sequel to one of the stories I mentioned earlier, The Adventures of Arthur Gordon Pym. So like he took Poe's story and then wrote a sequel for it to continue the story, but you know, from Jules Verne's imagination. Uh, Verne's writing is full of optimism about progress and European man's central role in 19th century culture, which included pro-expansionist and Orientalist ideas. So you, know, you have to imagine in the 19th century what was also taking place is that European powers were colonizing uh, many different uh, countries and, and, and lands across the world during that time. And Verne, uh, as well as others, viewed this in a positive light. Um, you know, looking back on it now, especially um, with something you might be familiar, familiar with, but if not, put this in your notes, uh, is the idea of post-colonialism. Post-colonialism, one word. Uh, you can look it up uh, on Google. But the idea behind post-colonialism is, you know, now, today, those countries that had been previously colonized have been able to uh, remove the, the restraints, the, the oppression of their former colonizers uh, to become free again. But you know, there's the indelible mark that's been left by the uh, colonizer on the colonized. Um, so I don't want you to think like you know, I'm agreeing with uh, Jules Verne and others of that time that uh, colonization was a good thing because in many cases it was you know terribly terribly bad um, but this is something that him as a writer would have seen in a positive light is the reason why I bring this up so Jules Verne was born and raised in the port of Nantes in a N T E S so it might not be surprising that the sea figures into many of his stories. The overarching theme of his writing is called Voyage Extraordinaires, and that's spelled V-O-Y-A-G-E-S, Extraordinaires, E-X-T-R-A-O-R-D-I-N-A-I-R-E-S, or in English, Extraordinary Voyages. Um, so, Voyage Extraordinaire, the V should be capitalized, the E should be capitalized, because this is a proper term uh, in French, or Extraordinary Voyages in English. Now, these Voyage Extraordinaires are near-future stories that take existing technologies just beyond what was then realizable. So, like, he extrapolates on the, on the near term, the near future. Verne takes the known and improves upon it for his stories. In his stories, readers learn something about science, technology, geography, and the natural world. So there's this teaching element to his stories as well. But his stories usually also have a satirical edge to them. You know, satire, the term that I defined earlier. Three notable works of Verne uh, that you should at least be familiar with these titles include Journey to the Center of the Earth from 1864 in which a group of adventurers navigate volcanic tubes through the earth beginning in Iceland and re-emerge in Italy. Then there's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea from 1869 to 1870 which is about Captain Nemo and his electric submarine called the Nautilus, N-A-U-T-I-L-U-S. While submarines uh, existed at that time, Verne takes the idea and improves upon it. And here's a Jeopardy fact for you. The term 20,000 leagues is a measure of distance, uh, not depth. So he's not talking about going 20,000 leagues under the ocean. It means traveling underwater across uh, 20,000 leagues of distance. Uh, also, Nemo, uh, Captain Nemo's name, means no man 
or no body, and is the name that Odysseus from Homer's Odyssey gives to the Cyclops. Uh, when, he's at, when the Cyclops asks, you know, what's your name? Uh, he, you know, Odysseus, instead of saying Odysseus, says Nemo, meaning no man or no body. He doesn't want it, the Cyclops who wants to eat him know who he is. Uh, so, in the story, in Vern's story, Nemo is a man outside society or community, much like Victor Frankenstein from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Uh, the character Professor Aronnax, A-R-O-N-N-A-X, talks about science, but always does so incorrectly. On the other hand, uh, the character Ned Land, uh, the Canadian harpooner in the story, uses common sense and reason to make educated guesses that prove correct over Aronnax's incorrect lectures. Finally, uh, a third story that you should be familiar with by Verne is Around the World in 80 Days from 1873 and it's about circumnavigating the globe aboard steamships and trains uh, which at that time you know, were wonders of new transportation technologies. So you know, this gives you some background on Proto-SF and its writers. Now let's turn to the two Proto-SF writers who you read for today's class, H.G. Wells, who you can see here, uh, and here's a picture of E.M. Forster. So first with H.G. Wells, uh, make sure you, you know his name, and it's, you, the way that you should commit it to your notes and use it when you write about him is H period, G period, Wells, W-E-L-L-S. Um, his first and middle name, H-G, stands for Herbert George, Herbert George Wells. And he was born in 1866 and died in 1946. Now, H.G. Wells is one of the seminal figures in the development of science fiction. He was born to working class parents. He won a scholarship to the Normal School of Science in London, where he studied biology with T.H. Huxley, um, who was born in 1825 and died in 1895. T.H. Huxley was a big deal. Uh, he was a scientific humanist and uh, he was called Darwin's bulldog, meaning that like he was very uh, a very ardent supporter of Darwin's theory of evolution, and so H. G. Wells studied under this guy known as Darwin's bulldog. This background and H. G. Wells's voracious interest in science and technology led to him writing some of the most groundbreaking fiction about evolution, invention, the prophecy of change, social extrapolation, and the promise and peril of science and technology. Um, notably, his fiction celebrates and cautions us about science and technology. So he both believes that it's a good thing but that we should also be cautious in the way that, that we use it because of its influence on society. Like Verne's uh, Voyage Extraordinaires, Wells picked up a name for his kind of proto-SF that you should know, and it's called Scientific Romances. That's with a capital S and a capital R. Scientific Romances. And I want you to know these four characteristics of scientific romances. One, scientific romances take an, a long evolutionary perspective. They look at the future, uh, you know, our future in terms of evolutionary terms, so like many you know, millennia rather than just like you know, a century or two. So they take a long evolutionary perspective. Two, there is an absence of a frontier, um, meaning that 
his characters aren't trying to explore um, places that we haven't yet gone to uh, in, a, in, in, a, in a sense. Three, there is a faceless or nameless hero or one powerless in the face of natural forces. So usually, whoever's the lead character in his stories, we may not know that person's name, or it may just be given like you know a placeholder, such as you saw in today's story, uh, the time machine. The time traveler is simply known as the time traveler. And then four, uh, these stories are pessimistic, or less less hopeful about the future. Like there's a certain pessimism about how things might turn out. Um, and we see this uh, in, a, in a certain extent with the, the full version of the time machine, which I'll discuss a little bit later. So those are the four characteristics of scientific romances that you should know. Now also, uh, make a note of some of his important stories uh, that I'll list out here. So some of his notable works include The Time Machine from 1895, which introduces the idea of a machine capable of moving forward or backward in time. And it focuses on the idea of long evolutionary time. Then there's The Island of Dr. Moreau, M-O-R-E-A-U from 1896, which connects to the themes of scientific creation in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein through the character of Dr. Moreau, who creates human-like creatures from animals. Then there's The Invisible Man, a grotesque romance from 1897. And this is a story about hubris, which we talked about before in an earlier lecture. Uh, a scientist devises a way to reduce his body's refractive index to that of air and thus become invisible with a goal of faint gaining fame and fortune. So this, the scientist uh, is very hubristic about what he's achieving by becoming invisible. And of course, you know, he gets his comeuppance in the story. Uh, then there's The War of the Worlds from 1898, which is about the invasion of Earth by resource-depleted and strange-looking tentacle-armed Martians driving their mighty tripod walking machines armed with heat rays and chemical weapons. But the aliens' lack of immunity to our Earth-bound bacteria kills them before the Martians kill all of humanity. Then he uh, published The First Men in the Moon in 1901, which is about two British men constructing a spherical spaceship out of a newly designed metal called Caverite that negates the force of gravity and permits them to fly to the moon where they experience weightlessness during their journey and encounter the insect-like selenites, S-E-L-E-N-I-T-E-S, on the moon. And then finally, uh, there's The Star. Uh, this is a short story. All those other examples were novels. This is a short story called The Star, published in 1897. Um, I used to have students read this story rather than The Time Machine. Um, so I'll go through like what the star is about uh, in case it's something you might want to take a look at later on your own. The star is a short story that is widely anthologized about the passing of a rogue star through our solar system and the terrible ecological effects brought by this wayward star on our planet. Like Kepler's Somnium, which I mentioned in the first lecture, um, we see at the end observa observations made about Earth from another point in the solar system, from Mars, by the Martians, who are very different beings from men, quote-unquote. 
We see at the end Wells allude to the social benefits that come to humanity as a result of our weathering this catastrophe. Finally, the story takes a big perspective um, in that there's no single hero to thread the story together. Its perspective is cosmic and on the level of the universe. Um, and something that you might look up on your own is go um, just do a Google search for the phrase pale blue dot. Pale blue dot. Uh, and then switch over to uh, image search. And the pale blue dot uh, is the term given to a picture of Earth that was taken uh, by the Voyager 1 spacecraft six billion kilometers away from Earth. Uh, this was something that was orchestrated by Carl Sagan, uh, the famous astronomer, uh, who you know, had a very important, you know, big role in the Voyager spacecraft, which made observations, that made the grand tour of our solar system. Uh, and his idea was that in order for us to have a better perspective about the things going on in our world, is why don't we take, like, in a sense, uh, um, a family photo of the Earth from a great distance away. So as Voyager 1 was leaving our solar system, he convinced NASA to turn it around so that the cameras would be able to take a picture of Earth from that far away so that we could see just how small and insignificant we are on the cosmic scale. And the hope was that maybe we would get a better perspective on some of our differences and our arguments if we were to see that, you know, in the big scheme of things, maybe how insignificant they really are. Um, obviously, this may not have worked out as well as Sagan had hoped, you know, considering our politics today. But it, I think, is something that we should be reminded of and something we should return to um, to recognize just how small we are in the universe. Now, for today's class, you read an abridged version of Wells's The Time Machine from 1895. While there had been stories written before, such as Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol in 1843 and Mark Twain's A Connecticut Yankee at King Arthur's Court in 1889, uh, these do not rely on science and technology to, to discuss how a person travels in time. The former example involves Scrooge's dream, so he travels through time in a dream. And then the latter uses a massive punch to the side of Hank Morgan's head to send him back in time. You imagine, you know, the guy that, that, punt, that knocked him out must have gave him a wallop to send him back uh, to King Arthur's court and Camelot. Um, but Wells' novel is set apart from these examples because it does a couple of important things. First, it relies on the idea of time as a fourth dimension, where length, width, and height distances are the first three. So, if you think about it, you know, we can move through space, three dimensions. He configures time as a fourth dimension that we can move forward or backward along. Second, Wells devises his story around the time traveler's invention of a time machine, a technological apparatus that one may use to travel forward or backward along the fourth dimension. It's not just a matter of having a dream or getting punched out that allows you to travel through time. It's that you need some kind of technology to permit you to do this. Uh, you can imagine how these ideas got updated in Robert Zemeckis's Back to the Future trilogy, in place of the time machine in Wells' story, in Back to the Future, we have a DeLorean outfitted with a nuclear-powered flux capacitor that's controlled by time circuits. Now, back to Wells' novel, the time traveler goes forward into the future to the year 802,701 AD, where he encounters the serene Eloi E-L-O-I, 
and the dangerous Morlocks, M-O-R-L-O-C-K-S. Considering Darwin's theory of evolution, the time traveler deduces that the Eloi and Morlocks are divergent species from Homo sapiens, one bred for slaughter and the other intelligent cannibals. This division reflects a societal division between the dilettante upper class, meaning the Eloi, and the working lower classes, the Morlocks getting their revenge on their past oppressors. In the abridged version, the time traveler escapes the Morlocks and returns to the present. In the full novel, following his escape from the Morlocks, he travels into the distant, far distant future and sees that life on Earth has devolved into strange crab-like uh, creatures. And then he goes further still to observe the sun uh, grow in size and then diminish to nothing and see uh, that what's left of Earth is just a barren and cold world that's lifeless before he returns to the present time and then sets out again never to return. We don't know where he might go to. Now, the second author's work that you read for today's class is by another British writer, uh, and that's E. M. Forster. E. Period, M. Period, Forster. F O R S T E R. And the E. M. stands for Ed Edward Morgan. Edward Morgan Forster. And he was born in 1879 and he died in 1970. Now, Forster only wrote this one proto SF story, The Machine Stops, um, in 1909. And so, just to make a note, with uh, the Time Machine by Wells, you should underline its title because it's a book, even though you read the abridged version, which makes it more like a novella in terms of length. The Machine Stops is a short story, so we put it into quotation marks around the title. Quote, The Machine Stops, end quote. And remember that it was published in 1909. So, E.M. Forster's other fictions are what we would call mainstream or realistic. They are dramas about the human condition. In general, his writing includes strong themes of humanism and social connect, uh, connection, issues of class differences, sexuality, uh, and symbolism, or uh, meanings in things or symbols. Some of his most important realistic fictions include Howard's End from 1910, which is about uh, social conventions and fin de sickly interpersonal relationships. It's like turn of the century relationships. Uh, then in 1908, he published A Room with a View, which is about the personal life of a young woman in Edwardian England. That's the Edwardian period is the late 1800s, the late 19th century, very beginning of 20th century. And then one of my personal favorites, a Passage to India from 1924, which deals with the theme that we will explore later in science fiction, which is uh, termed The Other with a capital O. Um, the Other, or that which is distinct from, different from, or opposite to some something or oneself. So you can imagine, like in science fiction, aliens or robots are often depicted as the other. They're, some, they're a different kind of being than we are ourselves. And so that difference between them and us is usually the tension that can drive the story. Uh, but also, in many cases, the other is shown to be just like ourselves, even though in the beginning we may think that they're different because of the way they look not necessarily the way that they are on the inside in terms of the way they feel or think. Um, now, in the case of the story, A Passage to India, or this novel, uh, it's about the meeting and unfortunate confrontation between the white British colonizers, who were viewed as the self, 
and their other and their Indian subjects, you know, the people that they are now in charge of, who are viewed as the other. Now, for today, you read Forster's The Machine Stops, remember in quotation marks, from 1909. It focuses on the questioning and curious Kuno, K-U-N-O, and his blissfully ignorant mother, Vashti. Kuno questions the hive-like, technologically mediated existence that they all live in, underground, while Vashti is content and happy with her machine-mediated existence. While most people venerate and worship the machine, some do not and are banished to live on their own on the surface of the earth, above where the machine exists underground. Now, Kuno admits to his mother as having seen the surface once before being taken back into the hive by the machine. As the story progresses, the machine begins to break down and with it, the hive and the machine-mediated human civilization. Those living on the surface are humanity's last best hope for survival after everyone uh, below ground, including Kuno and Vashti, dies. I want to point out how prescient uh, Forster was with his story. Prescient, P-R-E-S-C-I-E-N-T, meaning like uh, having foresight, being able to imagine how things might be in the future. Um, there are intelligent machines, self-repairing machines. You think of like artificial intelligence, robots, uh, kind of like you, if you think of it, something analogous to the machines uh, in the Matrix, right? Uh, except in this case, humanity had built these machines to work for us. Um, there are air transportation networks. There's video conferencing. Uh, there's information serving machines, much like computers with an internet connection. Obviously, none of this existed at the time he was writing the story. I mean, this wasn't even on anyone's radar. Uh, and he you know, came up with imagining these inventions, like seeing the technology of his day and seeing how they might be in the future. But most importantly, he took those ideas of these new inventions and imagined what they might do to our social relationships. You know, if we have these technologies um, that are dividing us, allowing us to, you know, in a sense, you know, work and live together but at a distance, what would they do to us? So he shows how we are shaped by our technology, that we get fat, we get lazy, um, due to our technological isolation and social distancing um, that the communication technology mediates, right? That it allows us to, to live this more sedate life rather than going out and doing things and being active much like what we've been experiencing under uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Another, you, know, you might also think of um, the Pixar film WALL-E, uh, I think also shows how this might be uh, to a certain extent. So Forster points to Wells as the inspiration for this story, but it wasn't because Forster thought Wells' ideas were great. Instead, Forster thought that Wells' insistence on evolution and not technology as being the driving force in historical development was misguided. Forster wrote The Machine Stops as a way to illustrate his point. Forster's story reflects a deep skepticism of human dependence on technology and what effect that technology will have on humanity's development. Wells, on the other hand, generally argue that the effects of technology on social development could lead to better social arrangements for the good of everyone. Forster, however, sees technology as a threat to humanistic values, namely human agency, meaning having control, uh, human values, uh, empiricism, and rationalism, like being able to figure things out and being rational about things. Forster extrapolates the technology available at the turn of the century and imagines what they would be like in the far future, 
and what effects they would have on people. As you read, his vision is like a nightmare. Nevertheless, I want to be fair to Wells, who I argue took an even-handed approach by showing the promise and peril of humanity's future. In the time machine, Wells is presenting his own warning against Whig interpretations of history. That's spelled capital W-H-I-G, Whig interpretations of history, or an interpretation of history as the continuing and inevitable, inevitable victory of progress over reaction, meaning that history is always onwards and upwards. Wells doesn't buy into that. Um, however, Wells and Forster are correct to point out that there is nothing guaranteeing the Whig view. Uh, of course, there is that potential, but there's also the potential for dystopia, degeneration, devolution, and other negative outcomes for humanity. So that concludes like the main lecture part of today's class. Um, so what I want to turn to now is give you a reminder about the research essay that you should be thinking about. I've already heard from a couple of students that have come up with some great ideas, uh, had some good questions. So make sure that you do think about a single work that you want to choose for your analysis, and it has to be a work that we have not read in our class. That doesn't mean that you can't bring up some of the things that we read in class um, as like you know, counter examples or examples to refer to, but the main topic of your paper needs to be a science fiction uh, story uh, you in a film or a novel, uh, short story, TV series, uh, video game, album, like music, or even art uh, that you focus on. You choose what that is. Um, so what I want you to do is make sure you, when you've come up with an idea or maybe a, a selection of ideas, email those to me and I will get back to you and let you know like you know, what I think may be the best option. Um, I might be able to give you some counter examples that may help you decide. Uh, if I know of research that you might want to look at, I'll include a link. Uh, so that's a back and forth to help you pick the best paper for you to work on because I want these to be something that you can be proud of, not just something you're writing for a grade, but that you can carry outside of our class to maybe get published um, in the City Tech Writer, uh, to maybe include on your LinkedIn.com profile as an example of your uh, academic writing. Uh, so I, I want them to get more mileage than just simply giving you a grade in my class. And I think by working with you all on that, uh, that I can help you do that better. Now there's no deadline on this, except for obviously the deadline at the end of the semester when your research essay is due. But I do want you sooner rather than later to email me so that we can discuss what your topic will be uh, on, on the project. Also, uh, as, a, as another resource you can use in your research, because uh, you know I, I said like your research needs to come from the library, right? Because those sources are all vetted. We know that there's good um, information that you'll get from those sources in the databases and in ebooks. I also want to say this is an acceptable source for you to use as a quotable resource and that's called the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction and you can see the link on your screen right now sf-encyclopedia.com uh, this is a resource that's been published uh, for a number of years originally it was in a book like this thick that if we were in my office back at school I would have brought to class but uh, you here at home I don't have it here but it's a really big ass book but imagine that big ass book has been further expanded, made bigger over the years online. Um, and you can see here the authors uh, that have organized it, the editors, uh, John Clute, David Langford, Peter Nichols, and Graham Slipe. They work with other researchers like me to write all the entries in the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction. So like for example, you could look up something like um, Back to the Future. And you can see the first entry here, Back to the Future, tagged as film. I'm going to click on that. 
and you can see that the entries are, are all interconnected and linked. So you can find like Robert Zemeckis, find out more about him. It's produced by Steven Spielberg, find out more about him. You can see that it's a time travel story. So you can like click on that link for time travel and that takes you to the main entry on time travel. And this has been researched by you know, professionals in the field of science fiction studies. And you can learn more about other, you know, what time travel stories are. And there may be something in here that you can quote in your essay. Or just simply to do some background research and learn more about the topic for what you're going to be working on. So the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction, sf-encyclopedia.com, is an acceptable additional source to use in your uh, research essay to get background on what it is you're researching. All right, so that brings us to homework. So for next week, um, I gave you links on the syllabus for Hugo Gernsback's A New Kind of Magazine. That's the editorial, like I think on um, page three, it's the very beginning of the, that magazine. It's only one page, but it tells you about science fiction. That's the word that came to be known as science fiction. Then we got E.E. E. Doc Smith and Lee Hawking's uh, Garby's The Skylark of Space, part one. You only have to read the first part. Um, the other parts are in the subsequent issues of that magazine. If you want to read that, that's fine. Um, and then C.L. Moore's Chamblot, uh, which is a space opera kind of story that's a lot like uh, the beginning of Star Wars, uh, in a sense, like more like um, Western meets uh, science fiction. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, so we'll talk about those stories next week. Also due by next week is, is a 250 word reply to the weekly writing assignment that I'll post on our Open Lab site. You summarize what are the highlights, what are some of the things that, that stood out in your mind from the lecture and from the readings. You're always welcome to write more than 250 words, but what I'm grading on is best effort on those 250 words that are required. I won't be nickel and diming you on grammatical mistakes. But you know, think of this as writing practice as well. It's meant to help improve your writing. So when you get to doing that research essay, you're like you know, primed to give me your best work for that. And then the big thing that's due uh, by next week is your midterm notebook. Basically, all of the notes that you've made for our class between the beginning of the semester until this week, um, you'll want to include in that. Um, and your, your notes should encompass the lectures, your notes should encompass your readings, and the notes can also include anything you've done so far on your research essay, uh, but it doesn't have to. Just saying, like, if you've already done some work on that, that can be a part of what you include in your scan of your notebooks. Now, as I mentioned before, on the syllabus, do, 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 do. Midterm class notebook. So this is 20% of your grade. This is what allows me to give you a satisfactory or not satisfactory for your midterm grade. Is you need to make a scan of your notebook so that I can you know, see that you've been doing this work uh, that I value highly that I've talked about you know, before in class about in terms of um, you know, it being regular writing practice and improves your uh, memory of the topics in the class. It's good practices for when, when you enter the workplace and it can help like in your other classes as well as being a good note taker. So I, this is something that's worth 20% of your grade, not just simply because I said that, but it really matters to whether you're successful in the class or not, if you're making good notes or not. So this is like, not only am I looking to see that you've done this, but this is also practice to get better at note taking. Because again, all I'm looking at is best uh, effort on your part. Uh, I'm not going to be saying, oh, this person didn't use Cornell method. I'm, I'm not like that. I, I want this to be beneficial for you as a learning experience, but also uh, for you figuring out uh, how best to make notes uh, on your own. Now, on the syllabus, uh, I gave you links here for creating a PDF of your notes using either the Dropbox app that you can download for free. You can create a free Dropbox account. Um, to, to create this with um, and 
I'm going to be collecting it using a Dropbox link that I'll post on our Open Lab site that I'll show you in just a moment. Also, in addition to this, I will show you other ways uh, that you can use for making your to create the PDF scan of your notebook. Because you know, normally, if like we were meeting in person, you would be able to just let me hold your notebook and I would be able to check it off during class. But because we're separated and this is an asynchronous class. Uh, what I need is a PDF scan of your notebook that I can then you digitally flip through and be able to give you credit on your work. Also, I think this is really advantageous for you all to get practice with the, being more digitally literate with these tools and technologies that we all have access to but that you might not use on a daily basis. Um, because you might be called on to use these tools in other settings for other reasons. And if you already know how to use it in our class, it'll just make it that much easier to use it in you know, another situation. So what I'll do is let me zip over here to um, Chromium. So this link right here, I'm going to post on our Open Lab site. You click on that link and it's going to bring you to this page. And as you can see, you do not have to sign in to use it. Okay. Basically, from here, uh, you'll be able to click on Add Files, and then you just navigate on your computer or on your smartphone to where the PDF is that you created using whatever app you use, which I'll show you those in a second, um, or that you've downloaded to your computer, find it in the whatever folder it's in, select it, and then it'll upload to Dropbox. Or, if you're on your computer, you can simply drag that PDF to this little area of the window, drop it, and it'll begin uploading. All it'll ask for is your name and your email address, and then it'll save your file for you. Um, all right, so why don't we let me show you what that looks like. So I have the Dropbox link open. You can see I'm not signed in. You don't have to do that. And just click Add Files or Drag Stuff here. If I click on Add Files, you can see that uh, there's options for files from computer, folders from computer, from Dropbox. So like if you did use Dropbox to create your PDF, you can click that link from Dropbox, log in, and be able to pull the PDF directly from there. But if you have it say, like if you didn't use Dropbox to create the PDF, um, you can just use the files from computer option to find it on your smartphone or on your computer navigate to where it is, select it, and then upload it. So I'm going to use the Files from Computer option. You can see here it took me to my Downloads folder where I got a PDF. I'm going to select that and click Open. You can see now at the bottom, um, above where it shows the document I attached, it asks for my name. So I'm just going to type in Jason and JLS at citytech.cuny.edu and then click Upload. You're going to see this little progress thing, and then you see this little runner crossing the finish line when your file is finished uploading. You know that it's uploaded successfully. If you don't see this little guy, something might have went wrong, try it again. If you have trouble with this, you can email me and let me know what's going on. One thing to, to note, uh, I, mean, I, have, I often receive emails from students with technical problems. It's best to make sure you let me know what is going on as best you can, take a screenshot, provide descriptive language of what you see and what goes wrong to better help me help you. Um, don't just succumb to a feeling of, of anger, frustration, whatever it might be that you feel when something goes wrong uh, and not you know, give me as many details as you can. You have to be calm, collected, and then try to be as straightforward and descriptive as possible about what you see happening so that I can work with you to try to help you fix things. Because I think in all of my classes, whether it be science fiction, technical writing, or something else, it's important that uh, students uh, learn how to use these tools. And so I don't want anybody to give up out of frustration. There's always a solution. We'll work through it and figure it out together. Now, I'll also provide you links to show you how to scan uh, your notes. 
So like I've already given you a link to Dropbox about how to use the app on your phone and your Dropbox is available for Android as well as Apple iOS. So you can use that to create your PDF. Basically, you take your phone, right? Got a camera on it, open the Dropbox app, have your notes down on the table. So I'm gonna get in the screen. So like I have my notes here, first page, I use the app, press the plus sign, create PDF, take a picture of the first page, move that first page over, take a picture of the second page, move that page over, and you do that for all the pages in your notebook. And then after you've done that, it'll ask for a file name, give it a file name, and then you'll be able to upload that to um, my collection page that I'll have a, I, I'm giving you a link to. Similarly, I'll also give you a link to how to scan a PDF using Google Drive. Uh, which is also you know available on Android and Apple iOS, so it's you know cross-platform. And then I'll also give you a link about how to create a PDF using the Notes app on iOS. That's specifically on iOS, but that's built in, so like it's already there. You don't have to install anything else. So I'll give you all of these options. You choose the option that works best for your setup. Um, if you don't have a smartphone. Uh, if you don't have you know, a camera on your computer that you can use, if you don't have a friend you can ask to borrow their phone to scan the PDF, if all options are exhausted, email me and let me know and we'll figure out something together about how to, how to get this thing submitted. But I think that if you try to work the problem, uh, use like your city tech ingenuity uh, you should find a way to be able to scan the, your notebook into a PDF and then upload it to uh, the Dropbox link that I'll be posting on our Open Lab site. And that just needs to be turned in before next week. Everything that you've gotten so far, if you've missed some uh, notes, that's fine. Show me what you've got so far, okay? And you can let me know uh, in an email like that you're still catching up or you got behind for whatever reason. Um, but make sure you turn in something. That's that's key. All right, so that'll be the other thing that's due this week um, is midterm notebooks. And then finally, I uh, just want to remind you that I have my office hours on Wednesdays from 3 until 5 p.m. The link is on the syllabus to the Google Hangout. Um, so that's 3 to 5 on Wednesdays. You can email me, jellis at citytech.cuny.edu with questions. If something comes up that's affecting your performance in the class, whatever it might be. Uh, if you need to meet outside of my normal office hours, make sure you let me know what your availability is. Say, I'm available on Thursdays or Fridays, whatever it might be. And we'll figure out you know, where your times might mesh with my availability. Um, I've been taking on more responsibilities at City Tech this semester, so um, it's always a challenge to figure out other times to meet, but we will do our best to, to figure those things out together, okay? So I want to wish you all good luck, uh, not just in our class, but in all your classes. Uh, stay healthy, stay well, make sure you follow all the guidelines from uh, doctors and from the city. Um, to protect yourself, protect your families, mask up, maintain social distance, get a vaccine shot when you can. Um, and whatever shot is available to you first, they say, take it, doesn't matter. Uh, it's better to have something rather than nothing. Uh, I'll be doing the same thing when I get a place in line. Um, and so if you got questions, make sure you email me uh, or stop by office hours. I'd love to talk to you all, especially since we're asynchronous. Uh, it, it's much harder for me to meet all the students in the class and I do want to get to know you um, beyond just like what we uh, do together on our open lab site. So uh, good luck and I'll talk to you again next week.